Hi guys, Miss Fisher here again with another book. Um, this book is called The Bracelet. As you guys know, I am from San Diego, so every now and then I make the drive all the way from up here in Modoc County all the way down to San Diego, which is a nice 12 hour drive. Anyways, on my way, I go by the Manzanar internment camp. So when I go on my drive, I like to go and visit the internment camp with my daughter. So we got this book together because I really wanted her to learn about what the Japanese Americans had gone through um, during World War II as they were forcibly removed from their homes and put into internment camps, um, not because they had done anything wrong. So um, I feel like it's a really hard part of history that's really important to learn about. So that's why I really like this book. It um, really talks about what people went through as they were taken from their homes, um, taken from people they loved, lost, some people lost everything that they'd worked for in their entire lives um, to be put in really um, brutal camps where they didn't have proper insulation, um, they didn't have enough food and everything. So this book is called The Bracelet. So here's a picture of a home. So here's the picture. I'm gonna turn this so I can read it all. Emmy didn't want her big sister to see her cry. She wiped her tears away quickly, but she couldn't wipe the sadness inside. It's almost time to go, her mother called, and Emmy knew she would have to leave their home soon. She looked around her room. It was empty now as the rest of the house, like a gift box with no gift inside, filled with a lot of nothing. Emmy closed her eyes and tried to remember how it looked. Flowered chintz curtains at the window, her clothes scattered everywhere, her favorite rag doll and teddy bear sitting on the chest. She could even remember how the whole house looked as if she had closed her eyes and kept pictures inside of her head. Emmy and her family weren't moving because they wanted to. The government was sending them to a prison camp because they were Japanese Americans. And America was at war with Japan. They hadn't done anything wrong. They were just being treated like the enemy because they looked like the enemy. The FBI had sent for Papa had sent Papa to a prisoner of war camp in Montana just before he worked, just because he worked for a Japanese company. It was crazy, Emmy thought. They loved America, but America didn't love him back, and it didn't want to trust them. So I mean, like these are young kids. I mean, they didn't do anything. Their families didn't do anything. Emmy ran to the door when she heard the doorbell. Maybe, she thought, a messenger from the government would be standing there, tall and proper and buttoned in a uniform. Maybe he would tell them it was all a mistake, that they didn't have to go to the camp after all. But when Emmy opened the door, it wasn't a messenger at all. It was her best friend, Lori Madison, who was in second grade with her. She hadn't come to walk... She hadn't come to walk to school with Emmy, and she hadn't come to ask her to go roller skating. She hadn't come to show her a new dress or ask her to go to the store with her either. She came with a gift, as though she'd come for a birthday party. But she, wears an, she wasn't wearing her good party dress, and she looked just as sad as Emmy felt. Here, she said, thrusting her gift at Emmy, it's a bracelet. It's for you to take to camp. So these girls are in second grade. They're obviously pretty young. Lori helped Emmy put on the bracelet. It was a thin gold chain with a heart dangling on it, and Emmy loved it the minute she saw it. I'll never, ever take it off, Emmy promised, not even when I take a shower. Lori gave Emmy a hug. Well, goodbye then, she said. Come back soon. I will, Emmy answered, but she didn't really know if she'd ever come back to Berkeley. Maybe she would never see Lori again. She watched as Lori walked down the block turning and waving and walking backwards until she got to the corner. Emmy couldn't bear to watch anymore, and she slammed the door shut. So there's the bracelet with the heart, and her giving her a friend a hug. When the doorbell rang again, it was their neighbor, Mrs. Simpson. She'd come to take them to the center where all the Japanese Americans were to report. Come on, Emmy, get your things, her sister Reiko called. It's time to go. Emmy made sure her gold bracelet was secure on her wrist. Then she put on both her sweater and her coat so she wouldn't have to carry them. They could only take what they could carry, 
and her two suitcases were already full. Each family had a number now, and Emmy put tags with their number, 13453, on her two suitcases. Mama took a last look around the house, going from room to room. Emmy followed her, trying to remember how each had one looked before they were filled when they were filled with furniture and rugs and pictures and books. They went out for one last look at the garden that Papa loved. If he were here now, Emmy knew he would pick one of the prettiest carnations to bring it inside. This is for you, Mama, he would say, and Mama would smile and put it in her best crystal vase. But now the garden looked shabby and bare. Papa was gone and Mama was too busy to take care of it. It looked the way Emmy felt, lonely and abandoned. So, all of their belongings, anything that they had to take with them, had to fit within two bags because you had to be able to carry it. So if you are moving and if you have moved, think about how much you've brought with you. And I, it's probably a lot more than two bags. Just going down to visit my family, I have more than two bags. So I can't imagine having to pick what to, you know, what little to bring. When they got to the center, Emmy saw hundreds of Japanese Americans everywhere. Grandmas and grandpas and mothers and fathers and children and babies. Everyone was clutched, clutching bundles of suitcases and tagged with family numbers. Some people were crying, but most just sat quietly. Emmy's stomach was jumping up and down. She wondered if everyone was as scared as she was. She touched the small gold heart on her bracelet and tried to feel brave. When she saw soldiers carrying guns and bayonets standing near every doorway, she was so scared her knees began to wobble. Will they shoot if anyone tries to run away? asked her sister. But Reiko just shrugged. I don't know, she said solemnly. Maybe. So imagine that they're being huddled in all these places with very few belongings and there's soldiers standing there with guns looking at them like they've done something wrong. I imagine I would be very scared. So I imagine she would have been terrified, just like she said. Soon it was time for everyone to board the buses lined up at the curb. They would take them to the tan foreign race tracks, which the army had turned into a prison camp. As the bus started down the street, she knew well Emmy kept her eyes on the window. They passed Cato Grocery Store, where Mama used to buy bean curd and pickled radishes. The windows were boarded up now, and Emmy saw a sign still hanging on the door. It said, We are loyal Americans. I am too, Emmy thought. We all are. But the army didn't seem to think so. The bus sped down the water's edge and crossed the bay bridge, looking silvery in the sun. Goodbye, bridge, Emmy whispered. Goodbye, San Francisco Bay. Goodbye, seagulls. Emmy glanced at her big sister sitting next to her and could tell she was trying hard not to cry. Stupid army, Reiko was muttering. Stupid war. And there they were at the tan form racetracks. There was barbed wire fence all around it and guard towers at each corner. Armed guards swung open the gates and let the buses in, then closed them so no one could get out. They were locked in. So this is the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge. And she passed over it. They were assigned to Barrack 16, Apartment 40, and Papa's friend, Mr. Noma, helped him look for it. So when they say apartment, they don't mean like a regular apartment. It didn't have like a bathroom or kitchen inside of it. It was literally just like a tiny square room. And sometimes it wasn't even like, it didn't even have real walls. They would have just had curtains for walls. It wasn't among the mass of the army barracks built around the racetrack or in the infield. In fact, it wasn't a barrack at all. It was a long stable where the horses had lived, and each stall had a number on it. Well, here it is, Mr. Noma said as he came to the stall marked for number 40. This is your apartment. And me and Reiko peered inside. Gosh, Mama, it's filthy. No matter what anybody called it, it was just a dark, dirty horse stall that was littered with wood shavings, nails, rust, and dead bugs. There was nothing in the stall except for three folded army cots lying on the floor. Mama tried to cheer them up. I'll have Mrs. Simpson send us some materials for curtains, she said. It will look better when we fix it up. But Emmy could tell Mama felt just as bad as she did. And no one could think of anything else more to say. 
Mr. Noma went to get a mattress for them. I'd better hurry up before they're all gone, he said. He rushed off because he didn't want to see Emmy's mother cry. But she didn't cry. She just went out to borrow a broom and swept out the dust and dirt and bugs. So they literally were put into a horse stall. And there were still bugs and dirt and nails. And it would have been filthy and disgusting. And I imagine probably stinky. It was just after Emmy and Reiko had set up the army cots that she noticed. My bracelet's gone. Emmy screamed, I've lost my bracelet. Emmy looked in every corner of the stall and along the ramp that had led up to the stable. Mom and Reiko helped her, but no one could find it. It was getting dark, but Mama got out her flashlight and they walked back along the racetrack, retracing every step they'd taken. The track was muddy and full of puddles and the rain had left the day before. They looked and looked, but they couldn't find Emmy's bracelet anywhere. So here they are walking in the dark, looking for the bracelet with a flashlight. It was time now to have Stepper at the grandstand. Emmy stood with Mama and Reiko at the end of the long weaving line, each of them clutching a plate and a fork, but all she could think of was her bracelet. Already she'd lost the one thing that would help her remember her best friend. Emmy wanted to cry. So you can see the barbed wire fence, the barbed wire fence all along where they're standing waiting for their food. The next day, as Emmy unpacked her suitcase, she found her favorite red sweater. She remembered how she and Lori had both worn their red sweaters on the first day of school. They had matching lunch boxes, too. And after school, they'd gone to fly kites in the vacant lot near home. Emmy could just see their red and yellow kites dancing in the wind, and suddenly Emmy knew who was remembering Lori that very minute, right inside of her head, just the way she could remember every room inside of her house in Berkeley. Maybe she thought she didn't really need the bracelet to remember Lori after all. So in our town, I know a lot of you, we've had friends come and go, so I'm sure a lot of you have watched people, and maybe we don't have things of those people we've watched coming out of our lives, but we still have the memories inside of our head. And Emmy's starting to realize that, well, yes, the bracelet would have been wonderful to have, but at least she still had those memories. Mr. Noma came to put up a shelf for them. He'd even made him a table and a bench from scrap lumber. The first thing Mama put on the shelf was a photo of Papa, but Emmy knew she didn't need a photo of Papa to remember him. It was as though Mama had the same thought. You know, Emmy, she thought, she said, you don't need a bracelet to remember Lori any more than we need a photo to remember Papa or our home or all the friends or things we loved and left behind. Those are things we carry in our hearts and take with us no matter where we are sent. Emmy knew Mama was right. They would soon be sent to a camp in the Utah desert. But Lori would still be in her heart even there. Lori would always be her friend, no matter where she was sent. And Emmy knew she would never forget Lori ever. So this is the afterward. It has a little bit more information on what the internment camps were and what they um, were like, as well as people who went there and facts that happened after. In 1942, shortly after the outbreak with war in Japan, the United States government uprooted and imprisoned, what, imprisoned 120,000 West Coast Japanese Americans, two-thirds of whom were American citizens. So these are people who have been born in America, have lived here their entire lives, most of them. They had done nothing wrong nor broken any laws, but without trial or hearing, they were imprisoned first in abandoned racetracks and fairgrounds and then sent to 10 bleak internment camps loaded, located in remote areas of the country. In 1976, President Gerald R. Ford stated, not only was that evacuation wrong, but Japanese Americans were and are loyal Americans. In 1982, a commission established by President Jimmy Carter and the United States Congress concluded that after exhaustive inquiry, that grave injustice had been done to Japanese Americans and the causes of uprooting were race, prejudice, war hysteria, and failure of political leadership. That's a really fancy way of saying the Japanese Americans were profiled and 
the American Congress would put together a racist law to put them out of their homes and put them into internment camps. Six years later, the United States government officially acknowledged the injustice of the internment, apologized, and made symbolic restitution to those of Americans of Japanese ancestries whose civil rights had been taken away. So, in 1942 is when they were taken from their homes, and it was saying in 1988, the government finally made an apology. So, let's do some math here to talk about how ridiculously long that was before they finally were like, oh, yeah, we shouldn't have done that, which, I mean, to us, obvious, that was not okay. It was terrible, and honestly illegal and very very bad but unfortunately it took so long for the government to admit that that some people died before they ever even got an apology for it they were and then when they were finally released they would be released they had lost their homes their belongings and the government was like oh well sorry but not sorry so 1988 is when the united states government finally apologize so that's when the official apology came they were taken from their homes in 1942 so if we do subtraction here we know that 8 minus 2 equals 6 and 8 minus 4 equals 4 9 minus 9 is 0 and 1 minus 0 is 0 so that took 46 years 46 years before they officially apologized and that's why even though it's a really hard thing to learn about and not all history is fun I think it's really important you guys learn about it because most people don't talk about it and in our area um, where we are we are super close to Tule Lake and Tule Lake also had an internment camp so we were we're located between where two different internment camps were and thousands of Americans were brought there because we can say Japanese Americans because they are Japanese but they are Americans just like you and I and they were taken from their homes and arrested even though they did nothing wrong and later when they looked into the fact they had um, discovered that these Japanese Americans literally none of them were guilty and they imprisoned tons of people saying that they were terrorists and um, working for the Japanese and everything. And when they finally finished their investigations, they found that zero, yes, zero Japanese Americans were disloyal. And in fact, every single person they had imprisoned and sent to these internment camps were innocent. Nobody was guilty. It was just racism and people not... Um, being very respectful to other people's belongings so people who weren't normally quite um who weren't normally as well you would say not as racist but that is still racist so anyways um that's why this is really important to me and I as you guys know um I really like to read books and do our writings and research based on things in history that have really happened um so if you want to learn more about the japanese internment camps that's really great we have the manzanar which is in Sha um near the um, shasta mountains and you have the tule lake which is very close to where we are and that um you could um drive up to tule lake and you can uh, possibly walk around right now and i think still participate in social isolation there's not usually too many people up there um, there's not a whole lot to see, and um, a lot of it has been dismantled, and um, the buildings are now gone. But if you are ever going down the 395, the Manzanar internment camp still has buildings and examples and a beautiful museum that really showcases um, what it was like for those people, as well as shows the reality of the situation and um, has particular stories from individuals. And I met somebody um, there. Uh, last year who was a child um, during the um, internment camps time and had actually been there and he um, shared his story with me and he was really awesome if I can remember his name I think he has some videos on YouTube that I can try to link here um, that you guys can watch and I can maybe share with you guys all right so that is the end of the story it is called the bracelet and there's some really um, great stories on the internment camp it's really hard to say great because it was a really terrible thing 
but um, they really um, go over what it was really like and for these people. All right, you guys, thanks for listening to the story and a little bit more about the history of it all, and I hope to see you all soon. Bye.